guy gives me a thumbs up. Well, uh, uh, thanks to John for uh, coming down from Minnesota to uh, help us out again this year. Uh, gives um, great background into uh, the animal tracking side. So we're going to start today um, with uh, sort of diving into some of the tracking data and how to use R to explore the tracking data, uh, do some sort of basic visualizations and whatnot. Um, and then we're going to break for lunch. Uh, and then we're going to come back and start talking about resource selection functions in a little bit more detail, and then go into some detail of how to use, actually use them the data to get the data that you need for those resource selection functions. So, uh, take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Roland and Gil and everyone else. Um, so, I, my background is in statistics. It's not GIS. It's not movement, necessarily. It's not, um, tra I've never tracked any animal either. Never, I don't know if I've, yeah, I've probably I've held some black bear cubs or something, but that's about it. Um, so one of the things you're going to notice is that interdisciplinarity is is key to getting things done this year. You know, these days. Um, so if you have questions about statistics and R, I can help out with that. If you want um, the Enva data, we've got you know Sarah and Gil and others with that and tracking kinkajous, Roland and um, so. I thought I'd start off the day, you know, so one of the things I really liked about Gil's talk was he had great examples. And um, I'm going to kind of show you really poor examples, but show you kind of the methods behind them. And so one of the things is I want, you know, the key is to think about, well, what are your questions? What are your data? And what sorts of things do you want to answer? Maybe you get motivated by some of the questions that Gil was asking. And then my, my hope is that you can take some of the stuff that I've put together so you can say that's maybe how I'd calculate some of those things. Um, but you really need the questions first. So there's a lot of this. This is what I encounter a lot is that I want to do that because I saw it and it's cool. Um, but really good research is done by asking a good question first. So again, some of the examples that I'm going to show aren't necessarily illustrating really cool research questions like Gil did, but I'm going to try and highlight some of the methods. Okay, so some of the questions you might ask. These are really broad. You might ask questions about how much space an animal needs. Um, and we're not going to do a lot about home range, but I know Roland mentioned maybe at lunchtime if there's a group that wants to talk about home ranges, that's a possibility. But you might think about um, how much space does an animal need? Do they need or use more space at certain times of the year than others? You might have questions about how they move and how they change how they move depending on environment. So maybe you want to know if they move more or less during certain parts of the day or in certain types of habitat. You might want to know what sort of environmental conditions they're trying to key in on. So you may want to link resources or risks or environmental conditions to locations. And that's what we'll talk about with the resource selection functions. Um, and ultimately then ideally predict what will happen if the environment changes. So that's kind of the ultimate goal with a lot of those sorts of analyses. Okay, so um, some of the objectives of the couple days, we want to introduce some commonly used methods for analyzing animal location data, provide some templates that you can hopefully use and adapt to your own data, um, understand some of the different methods, some of the limitations, and then I think one of the best things about these sorts of workshops is you have an opportunity to interact with your peers and ask questions and um, try and make progress towards answering some of your own research questions. Okay. So um, Sarah's going to talk about the move bank annotation after this. I'm going to start out just now with going through that test data file that you guys ran through ahead of time and just think about how you might characterize movement at just either a really broad scale or at a more fine scale in terms of steps and, and turn angles. Um, and then hopefully you'll have some time to take your own data, annotate it, and ask questions about how movement um, is influenced by different environmental covariates maybe that you add on to your own data set. And then this afternoon we'll talk about resource selection functions or species distribution modeling. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about modeling habitat selection in the context of movement, so these step selection functions, uh, and then think a little bit about how do you apply these methods when you've got multiple animals. So that's, that's sort of a um, broad outline of what we hope to accomplish.
So let's start by just thinking about some movement characteristics. This is going to be very brief, and then we'll go into some of that R code. Um, we may have questions about really broad scale movement patterns. So Gil's example with the zebras moving was really pretty cool. So you might want to ask about do animals have, do they migrate between different home ranges? Do all, all animals in the population migrate? Or is it, um, do only some of them migrate? Do they only migrate during some years and not others? So you might want to have questions about really broad scale movement patterns. Or you might want to ask, questions about movement at a much finer temporal scale, or animals moving more or less during certain times of the day or in certain types of habitat. So Gill's uh, zebra example was similar to this example that I'm, I'm going to give. And this, this one, I think, is actually kind of neat. So these are um, invasive carp in Minnesota that a, a master student was studying. Uh, and this Lake Long Lake is actually where I take my kids swimming, so it's very close to home. There's, I don't know how many thousands of carp in the system. Um, and they migrate upstream to all these different lakes up here to spawn, but not all of them migrate every year. And their strategy is to essentially, um, Minnesota is very different from Raleigh or Mississippi or a lot of these other places, so all of our lakes freeze. And lakes that you can drive, you know, big, trucks on and everything else. So these smaller lakes, um, they'll freeze and a lot of the fish will die. And one of the main predators on these carp, the, the eggs, are these bluegill. And so there's a lot of fish kill in these streams. These carp migrate up there, lay their eggs, and um, that's how they're able to, to have a um, strong spawning event. And then they'll migrate back down to the big lake for winter, so this long lake is where most of these fish will overwinter. And so similar to what Gil was showing with looking at distance from a starting point, we looked at um, distance from the outlet of that lake and just plotted over time how these different individuals move. Um, so you have distance from the edge of that big overwintering lake on the y-axis and then Julian date on the x-axis. And so you can clearly see individuals that go out and migrate, and then some of them actually go out and come back several times, sort of like the zebra. I mean, we don't really know what these fish are doing. Um, but this is kind of a really gross scale look at what these fish are doing in this population. There's a few, um, like A up there in the upper right, that never left the lake, or we never detected that individual leaving the lake. and. There's one right there where, where the individual left and never came back. So this is just one simple way to be able to visualize like the gross scale movement patterns. There's a lot of work being done um, to think about characterizing movement in terms of distance between points relative to distance between time. So this is not my work. This is um, work being done at the Smithsonian. Chris Fleming and Justin Calabrese and others are doing a lot of interesting work um, on animal home range analyses and things like that. But here's another way to think about movement strategies. So on the y-axis, you can think about this as closeness in space, and the x-axis would be closeness in time. So points close in space tend to be close, uh, close in time tend to be close in space, and then at some point, there's an asymptote which would say after some point um, there's no more uh, observations are just always a constant distance apart on average. So you could interpret something like the lower right as an animal moving within a home range. At some point it's never going outside of its home range. So it's got an asymptote that says the distance between any two points on average do doesn't continue to increase with time. Whereas um, the model, say, in the upper left would suggest you've got an animal that's dispersing. The farther you go away in time, the more far away points are uh, in space. So this is another useful approach. I'm not going to talk about those today, but it's something to be aware of. There's a lot of really interesting work being done there. Um, so we can think of fine scale movement patterns two different ways. We can think in continuous time. And, I'm not, and, and I think that's a little bit harder entry point, so I'm not going to talk about that, but there are a couple of um, uh, links here if you want to explore some of that work. And some of this, actually Sarah pointed out to me, this is a cool um, web app 
um, for, for doing some of the continuous time movement modeling. So something to potentially explore there. We're going to think about movement in discrete time. So we're going to think about connecting locations, se sequential locations, in terms of a step length, how far the, the locations are apart from one another, and also turn angles. Um, which is probably easier to visualize here. So you've got a little gecko here. Um, the different black dots are sequential observations, so you can think about the distance between locations. And then the turn angles describe a, a change in bearing. So you can think about the, the individual is moving here, um, let's say east, and then it made a turn to go south, and then made another turn to kind of go back west a little bit. Um, so those different turn angles describe changes in bearing, okay? You could also think about just changes in absolute direction. So um, it was moving east, it's moving south, it's moving west. So you can think of two different types of angles that you might want to calculate, and then you could think about are those characteristics, do they depend on time of day, or um, are they turning more in different types of habitat? So. We're going to look at the, the vignette I put together today uses this R package called AMPT, AMT, Animal Movement Tools, and it'll calculate these different angles and step lengths. And there's lots of R packages that will do this, um, but the nice thing about this AMT package is that it returns a data frame. So if, you're, if you can plot in R, if you can do other things in R, you can take the output and work with it directly, which is, I think, um, a nice advantage. Okay, so we might want to think about do step lengths or turn angles change spatially or temporally? Do they depend on time of day? Do they depend on habitat, depend on season? Um, do individuals that are different age class, different sex, do they move in different ways? Um, so we could plot things like the distribution of step lengths here um, as a function of different habitat types and then turn angles as a function of habitat types as well. So on the right, um, things can get a little bit confusing if you haven't worked with angles for a long time. So you can calculate things in degrees. You can calculate things in radians. And so here, these are depicted in radians. Uh, the AMT package lets you select what, you, what sort of output you want. Um, another way to visualize the angles is to look at a, a rose diagram. So I think this is particularly useful. This is from an example looking at butterfly movement. And you can see, for example, differences here. So here's how the butterflies are moving within good habitat. They're essentially turning around. So you can think of them as foraging. They're kind of moving, using that habitat, staying within in the habitat. Whereas when they encounter a habitat matrix, the angles are pretty much centered on zero. So that means, that means they're not turning. So their turning angle is essentially zero. They're continuing to move in a straight line path. So here's a nice, simple, um, visual way to explore maybe how animals are moving and how that might depend on habitat type. So you could envision maybe with your own data whether maybe you've got Questions like this, if you can download uh, habitat data from, from MoveBank, then you could easily ask these sorts of questions. Okay, so that was just kind of a just brief introduction, and then I plan to go through the R code that, um, that I sent. Does anybody have questions on this? I mean, again, just very brief, trying to get you thinking about the sorts of questions you might want to ask with your own data. Okay. Well, then we'll, we'll jump into R. Actually, so I, I want to make one quick comment here because I think this is probably one of the most useful things you can take away. How many people have used R Studio before? How many people have used projects in R Studio? Okay. Um, how many people have used projects with something like ArcGIS? 
Even less. Okay, I, I'm not a GIS user. I just It's a similar sort of idea. It packages all of your things, your files together that are associated. So I think this is one of the most useful things to make note of. So um, the idea here is we have a project. For me, I've been working within this move bank folder, and you can see this move bank file, our project. And to start our studio with that project open, you could double click on that file. And that would open up um, our studio, and it would automatically set the working directory to where all these things sit. Okay. Alternatively, you could open our studio and go um, to recent projects and find that folder. Okay, and that would do the same thing. It would open um, open a new session in R, and it would automatically set the working directory. Can anyone think why that would be useful or important? Yes. So you don't have a bunch of set working directories, you have to search and search and search and search for copies. Exactly. So, um, so the point is here that I put together these data files. Well, I didn't put together the data files. I put together a folder with data, and I put together these R scripts. And if you look at how the data are read in, We have read CSV data and then the data set name. It doesn't say Windows, John Feeberg, My Documents, everything else. And ideally, you should have been, hopefully, you were able to download this folder, put it on your computer, and everything should run. So, um, and then think about in five years, you get a new computer and you take that directory and you move it to your new computer. And all of a sudden, if you had done things with work, setting the working directory and everything else, and you tried to run your code, it wouldn't work because it's no longer the same path. And you'd say, I've got, John put together five programs here. I have to go back and look at every place where the working directory is set, and I've got to change that. Here, you don't have to do that, right? You just copy this whole set of files over to a new computer. You can sell it to your friends for beer or whatever. And they should be able to put this whole set of um, files onto the computer, and everything should run. So that, I think, is an important, important point here. Did ever, did, is there, is there, are there people that had trouble getting this to run? That are willing to? OK. So <clears throat> I'm going to run through things using the HTML file that shows the code and output and just give you kind of a rough idea of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and then my hope would be that you would have time before lunch to try and either adapt some of some pieces of this maybe to your own data, or if you don't have your own data yet, maybe data that you could download from MoveBank. The other, the other purpose of this was just to make sure you had all these libraries so that you didn't have to be installing things when you were, you were here. Um, so again, some of this is not super interesting for the data that we're looking at. We're, these are Martin data that, this is Scott LaPointe collected, is that right? Yeah? Yeah, Scott, who's a student Who's a student? Fisher data. Fisher data. Uh, and, and I should say, these Fisher all have cool names, and I wish I would have brought that in. I just... Um, time limitations. Yeah, that's a good idea because it's it's a cool piece of the uh, of these data that that are lacking in my presentation here. Okay, so reading in the data, um, <clears throat> almost always you'll have some sort of data cleaning to do. So looking to see if you've got missing timestamps or location um, points, that's critical. So this. Um, complete dot cases will will return true if those three variables are all present for that observation and false otherwise. So this just provides a way to drop missing data. Um, another word here. So there's there's I, I think there's kind of two dialects of R. There's kind of the old school R uh, that I learned and probably am most familiar with, and then there's Hadley, Hadley Wickham's version of R and Hadley, how many people have heard of Hadley Wickham? Okay, so good part. I'd say Hadley Wickham's developed probably 
eight of the top 10 R packages that are being used, something ridiculous. So he's kind of, um, he provides <clears throat> ways to do things that are, I think at first hard to kind of conceptualize and get used to if you've been writing R code the traditional way. Um, and I'm still trying to transition. So um, <clears throat> a lot of this code may be different from how you're used to writing R code. Okay, so how many people have written R code with the percent um, greater than percent sign. Okay, so about half. I think that's probably pretty common. It's probably half and half. So uh, one of the things to note is that I might have written things differently, but I want you to just think about these are things that you can accomplish in R fairly easily. You could write code a different way and it would be just fine if you got, got to the same point. Um, I'll try and briefly describe what's going on here uh, and let you think about if you don't write code this way and you want to write code the old way or, or <clears throat> the non-Hadley way, that's just fine. So um, the pipes let you kind of read code in a sentence. So you could think about this line here, the into, it says take the Martin data, select those columns, so timestamp, location long, location lat, tag, local identifier, and then apply this function duplicated. So duplicated just says, are, are any two rows identical that have those same four variables? You could do this by just saying duplicated martin.dat and then select those columns. So if you, if you don't want to think in terms of these pipes, that's what those percent greater than percents are, you could write this a different way. You could just write duplicated and then the data set name with the, the columns that you want to check to see if they're duplicated. Does that make sense? So this is sort of comfortable trying to think about there's two ways to write code. Um, this is a good way maybe to get started if you haven't done things this way to try it out and see if you like it. And if you don't, there's no reason why you have to adap adapt this sort of style. Okay. When you read in data into R, it may not always know the right format. So here, we've changed the timestamp data to be um, a time date class variable here. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert with dates and times. And um, so move bank expects milliseconds too, right? So what I don't know if I could actually add It could be. So, What, one of the things I noted, so, yeah, so Sarah may talk more about that, and I gave, I don't know anything about annotating the data, so I gave data to Sarah, and she helped me out there, and needed the milliseconds, and I went back and changed this options, the digits, I should have like a pointer, so I don't have Sorry, to jump, I, I, no, yeah, I could, it's just more, I, I want to get some exercise, um, right here, digits dot sex equ uh, equals three. So that seemed to solve things. I'm hoping it solved things. I think it's more interesting when you jump. It's more fun. OK. I may still jump. We'll see. OK. So I'm also not, I haven't used the move, the move package a ton, but this is just illustrating how you can create a move object from the data. And it has a def default plotting method that shows here we have eight fisher. You can see one's kind of far away from all the others. Um, <clears throat> and you can get other information here that summarizes the data. So um, ranges of, of different variables and things like that. OK. There are tons of ways to plot and visualize data. So again, I'm not a GIS user. Some of you guys probably know how to do this much better than me. And I've just started kind of exploring different ways to plot 
location data in R. And so here's two different ways. Maybe others have good suggestions if you do. So one of the things I would say is don't just assume I'm the expert and what I'm showing you is the only way to go. You may, if, you have a, if you have a better way or something you really like, raise your hand and say, you know what, I really like visualizing the data this way and I think it would be a better display. I'm not gonna be offended. You'll share what you know with the rest of the group and everything else. Um, <clears throat> there's a ggmap package that lets you split display points on Google Maps and you can choose different backgrounds. Um, so this is just an example of showing one of the Martin Fisher. Fisher. Yeah, what did I call it, Martin? You used to have the same genus, but it doesn't really Yeah, so maybe that's it, yeah, okay. So it was originally Martin's Panatri. They recently changed it to be a different genus. Okay, so I'll probably do that too many times. But yeah, fish, one Fisher. So there you go. You can't, I don't know what you catch if you. Here's another package called Leaflet, which seems to be really popular. Anybody use Leaflet? Yeah, so we've got a few people. So the cool thing here, you can actually move, move things around, which is kind of neat. You can explore up and down. Again, there's different, um, different background maps you can select. So uh, where the, so this says Leaflet. Uh, um, data set, add the tiles, that puts the background map on and there's different things you can select there to have different kinds of background maps and then add the points, add the circles which are the lat and long of this uh, fissure. Okay, so one of the things I want to point out is that you kind of, you need like just a base level of R and then you need to know what do I want to do and you need to know about Google. So. Um, I'm not explaining this in a ton of detail, but I didn't know anything about Leaflet a month ago. And so part of it is go find what people are doing and it's not hard to mimic this. Like, so you should be able to hopefully take your data and do the same sort of thing. That's the goal. Um, maybe while I'm on that, I got a little distracted during Gil's talk with the space-time cube. And um, I'll, I'll upload on, on Google, but you can put together a little space-time cube in R that'll actually um, you can rotate this thing and everything else, and you can put color and... What's the color mean? Uh, I mapped color here to elevation class, like I cut elevation into like five groups, and okay. so I'll put that up. But part of it, again, um, I saw space-time cube, I googled space-time cube R, and there was an example. So, I mean, you just need to get a comfort level and be able to adapt to others' code, and you should be able to do a lot of really cool stuff. Okay. And then I just did some more maps showing the location data for each fissure without any sort of background. But you can kind of get an idea of their movement patterns a little bit. And then everything on one map. Okay. Now we're finally getting into how do you uh, take the location data and start to do something useful with it beyond just visualizing the data. And so I've been working with um, Johanna Signer is at University University of someone help me out Göttingen. 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 Say it again. Göttingen. Göttingen. Um, I probably still butchered it. But uh, so Johannes put together this AMT package, and I think I mean first of all he's a geni genius. If you don't believe me, how do you pronounce your name again? Ni Nino. 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 <laughs> Um, she's worked with Johannes, and Johannes put together this package partly to be able to visualize animal location data and partly to be able to fit these step selection functions, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, and he's usually pretty good about responding if you've got questions, if you run into any, any sort of problems. Um, he, he's usually qu very helpful. So the key here is to create a track, okay? And we can do that with this um, MK track function or you could type make track, either one will work. So then you have to give it a data set name. So here martin.dat for the Fisher data. <laughs> um, X location, Y location, timestamp. You can have I an ID variable if you've got multiple animals. Um, and you can specify a coordinate reference system. 
Okay, so here is taking the data, the lat, lat long data. If you have UTMs, that works too. You can, you can use XYs that are UTMs. And then he's got um, a function from a different package that he's pulled in that lets you calculate time of day, whether it's day or night. So again, uh, let's see if I can use this. Center button. Okay, so here this says take. So first of all, one of the cool things about this function is it returns an object that has this track functionality, but it retains the data set functionality. So if you just plot with ggplot, you can plot like you did before. It doesn't change anything, which I think is pretty, pretty useful. Um, this is saying take that track object and calculate time of day and then add it back on as a variable name. Um, and then we're going to transform to geographic coordinates here. So I don't know a ton about projections, but there's lots of people here that do. Um, okay. And then we're going to use the AMT package to calculate all these different things. So absolute direction. So again, if it's how, how, what direction relative to north. Or if you want to have it direction relative to east, you can specify that. Um, turning angles, step lengths, net squared displacement. So this is the distance from the first point. So if you want to think about those carp movements and, and whether they're migrating back and forth, you have to be a little bit careful if your first point is, say, in between two home ranges. Um, then, then you might have something that kind of goes back to the middle and back down and steady. But, um, Easy way to calculate that. And there's different arguments here. So you can calculate things in radians. You can calculate distances or, or angles between 0 and 360 or between minus 180 and, one, and 180. Um, you have different options. OK. So this is where, again, the code gets a little bit different from how I would have written code to do this in R two years ago or even a year ago. Um, if you think about things like angles, we have a data set right now with a bunch of different individuals. If we just calculated, even let's just think of something really simple, step length, so distances between two points, and we just said, how far are we from the previous location? At some point, we're going to have a distance between two different individuals, which we wouldn't want, right? So we kind of want to do some of these calculations on an individual by individual basis. OK, so you could do that with a loop. You could just set up a loop and, and, and do things by individual. Or um, a really kind of slick way to do this that's um, the Hadley-Wickham way is you can create these nested data frames. OK, so what I put together when I did this last year, I, kind of, I wanted to learn something new. And Johannes, this is the way he thinks. And so I said, I'm going to try and think the way Johannes thinks, because that's usually a good thing. OK, so what this does, you, we take the track data set and we nest it by ID. So now we have what looks like, it's, it, you could call this a nested data frame. So it's a data frame of data frames. So each row has data from a different individual. So the, here's our eight different fisher. And um, you can say, I want just the data from the first fisher by saying, take that object and take the data. So it's got two columns, an ID column and a data column. And if you say, I take the, the data column and I want the first one, you'll get all the data from the first fissure. That makes some sense. So it's a way to kind of nest all these things together. And then you can apply things by animal then, which is kind of a slick way. You know, if you want to fit models to each individual animal or you want to calculate different characteristics by each in individual animal, you can do it with just a few lines of code, which is really kind of nice. Yeah. Right there where you're looking at the individual animals, can, can you also can you group the problem with a one or the, uh, the only one? Yeah, I think, yeah, you could do. These, so the questions like this are great. The best way, I'm not, I'm not actually sure of the answer. Gil says yes. I, I probably, I believe him because, but that's the best way, right? Yeah, yeah. So I would encourage you, tinker around with this stuff, um, and you should have time today to do that. Yeah. I would guess that you just keep one, two, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, you can unnest to get back to the original 
So the other way you do it is you unnest and then you select those four individuals you want. That would be another way to do it. There's always a million different ways to do the same thing. Again, you only need one. So, okay. So this just shows um, relative directions. There's a function in the AMT package for calculating. So these are the turn angles. And you can give it a data set and it'll give you um, the turn angles. Why is it missing originally? Because you have to have actually three locations. The qu good question would be why is it not missing twice? Because you need three locations to get an angle. Okay, because you have to think about the first two locations give you your first direction and then the third gives you, give you, gives you the angle off of that. Okay, so like I said, you could do this in a loop, but this line of code, this little bit of code, um, will calculate all those different angles. It'll calculate step lengths and net square displacement for all those different individuals. So let me try and explain this. Um, we're gonna take the track data set, we're gonna nest it by ID, and then for each row, we're going to apply these different functions. So we're gonna apply the direct, absolute, we're gonna, we're gonna create a variable called, okay, let me back up a little bit. Mutate is another function that Hadley Wickham uses in the dplyr library to create a new variable, okay? So th with this mutate, we're gonna create four new variables, one called dir abs, which are gonna be the uh, absolute directions, relative directions, step lengths, and net squared displacement. Okay. Um, just for fun, I think Johannes likes to name things with underscores. I don't know why. I, so he helped me put together the original code and then I adapted it and we were kind of going back and forth and he likes that for some reason. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and so map is, has anybody used L apply before in R? Okay, so this is doing the same thing. It's like, it's applying a function to a list, but now our list is, is a list of data frames. So this is gonna map the data, it's gonna take the data column, and for every row of data, it's going to calculate the absolute directions, and we're gonna add these arguments to say, I want, um, I want the angles to go from zero to 360 instead of minus 180 to 180, and I want the zero to be absolute north, so I want um, an angle relative to due north. And we're gonna also create this new variable by applying for each data set, we're gonna calculate the relative directions, the step lengths, and the net squared displacement. And then we're gonna unnest everything at the end so we get back one big data set. So again, if you wanna see this, what I would say is break this down a little bit. You could, you could look at what it looks like without this unnest and you'll have, you'll have rows, eight rows still, one for each fissure, and it'll have these extra columns with those variables, and then the unnesting puts it all back together into one big data set. And then here I created a bunch of more, more variables, the week, the month, the year, the hour of each location. Here we, we don't have to do this by individual because there's no connection between successive locations, so we can just say I just want the hour of every location and append that as a new variable. So you get something that looks like this. So um, you have each row. So this unnests everything. Everything's back down to, to a normal data frame. It's a, a tibble. Do people know what tibbles are? So, okay, so tibble is, a, is Hadley Wickham's version of a data frame. It just, but it has some defaults that are a little bit different. Like it doesn't print all the data, which if this was just a data set, it would print all the data and this HTML file would go on for days. So um, there's some little differences there between tibbles and data frames, but it's just like a data, you can think of it like a data frame with a few extra options built in. Okay. So at this point, you can use these appended columns to ask whatever questions you might have, especially if you've already annotated your data, you could say, do step lengths depend on Habitat, do turn angles depend on habitat? Certain habitats are the animals turning more and foraging and others that they're trying to move through quickly. Um, so I just, I don't know, these plots aren't anything 
fantastic, but just illustrating, um, again, how you can look at some of these distributions. So these are the angles relative to due north uh, using ggplot and showing these kind of rose diagrams so that you can get a picture for each animal, how they're moving on the landscape. Uh, turning angles. And, and maybe someone can answer this question for me. So one of the things you'll note with a lot of these individuals, you'll get distributions of angles where you've got a lot of zeros and a lot of turning around backwards. So you're either continuing to move in the same way or you're basically turning and going backwards. And I think I have an explanation for this, but I'd be interested in if others have seen this and have a expl potential explanation. I think it's probably measurement error. So these, some of these locations are every two minutes or less, I think. I think most of these fish are there every two minutes. So um, if you happen to be off, a little, let's say the animal's standing still and you're off a little bit that way, and then you're off, you're on average gonna be off the other way and it's gonna look like you turned around, but you may have stayed in the same spot. That's my thought, but... I think turning angles should be viewed the same way that the meteorological wind roses do. So you break turning angles by movement distance, and you, you get E. So ah, yeah, yeah. So here, the turning angle, if you made a tiny little movement back and forth, yeah. it will come the same as turning angle if you were running and curve a little bit. But if you interpret the turning angle of fast movement differently than turning angles of slow movement, that's a great point. Yeah. Who's going to do that at the break? Maybe me. Oh, is there a windrose function? There's a windrose function. Pretend it's a windrose. This is what I'm talking about. So if you know a better function or anything, this is part. So there's a windrose function that'll create these. You need speed and direction for windrose. Okay. So just take the. Pretend that the turning angle is the direction. Yeah. Pretend that the step left is the speed. It's the speed. Yeah. Yeah, Extra yeah. credit to anybody who does that. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't think uh, the GPS error should be fairly random. I don't know why it would be 180. Well, I'm saying even if it's random, let's say you're staying, staying put. If it's random, it's going to be a return. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so, th so everyone here gills points. So two points there. One is there might be a better way to display the data. Two is that we should be able to explore that. So one of the interesting questions you might want to ask is, um, are turning angles very different? And you probably expect that they would be depending on movement distance between points. So if you have, if you make a big move, your yeah, turning angle, yeah, especially with data collected at fine temporal scales. So at fine temporal scales, your turn angles and your steps should be correlated. Does that make sense? If I'm going to get to the bathroom in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to be walking straight. Um, but if you get a location every hour and it, you find I'm in the bathroom the next hour, I might have taken any number, you know, my turn angles might be all over the place. So you, you could explore that, right? You could look at the distribution of angles relative to how fast the animal was moving. You can also display these as histograms if you, if you like that better. So you can see here most of the movement straight forward and then you've got these 180 and negative 180 turns. Um, for the for the fisher, the net square displacement's not super interesting because I think they're just kind of moving around throughout the landscape. So you can kind of see um, this is distance from the starting point. So they're making kind of some long moves and then back. So they're they're revisiting similar areas. Would be what what I would kind of get from this. But I just wanted to show how you could calculate this sort of metric and, and visualize it in terms of a very gross scale movement pattern for these different individuals. Um, you can do plots of step lengths versus time of day. So you can see a few of these individuals appear, can't see the X axis yet, but some of the individuals appear to be moving more at night. I don't know if that makes sense for Fisher. Would they move more at night? Yep. Yeah. So you can kind of pick that up. So again, I'm just trying to give you an idea of some questions you might want to explore with your own data and show that you know this. the nice thing about the AMT package is that you get a data set, a data frame,
back. So if you know how to plot an R, you can, you can ask any question you want. You've got potentially annotated data, and you've got locations and step lengths and turn angles, and you can, you can explore things however you, however you choose. Um, there's a couple functions in there for calculating just um, sort of old traditional home range metrics, so minimum convex polygons around points or kernel density estimates around points. And um, I think one potential use for something like this is you could say, well, is the amount of space they're using, is it changing over time? So this is a really rough way to look at that. And um, so here it's taking, again, that data set, it's nesting it by ID, year, month, and week. So now there will be a separate row for each combination of individual year, month, and week. And then it's going to create a new variable that's the area of a minimum convex polygon, um, dropping off 5% of the observations. Uh, and that's calculate, calculating that area. And then we're going to just save some of those variables and unnest. So this will create a data set that has a different measure of how big of an area an animal used, broken down by year, month, and week. And then you can plot that to say, well, it looks like individual seven. The HR Institute of the Scrutiny or something? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, usually with the map function, you don't have to do that. But I don't know why sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So I'm still, I'm still a novice when it comes to nested data frames. Is this related somewhat to the nested data frame or related somewhat to that specific HR function? It's probably an interaction between the two. Yeah. Yeah, and I wish I, I could put some links up. Again, like I, I'm, I'm just starting to learn how this works. But um, there are some really nice th features about it, particularly when we go to fitting models, because it's really nice to fit models to each individual. And, um, and that's a place where this can be really useful because you can, you can fit models to individuals and you can pull the coefficients off from those models and store them as another data frame with the, all the coefficients. So to me, that's one of the really powerful ideas behind this. So again, this is nothing super interesting, but maybe for one of your questions, you want to know, um, are individuals using a bigger area at certain times of the year? And uh, this would suggest, you know, you could see maybe these are broken down by weeks. And I think you only follow, the Fisher were only followed for certain months of the year, right? Yeah. So if you had a longer data, let's say you had GPS data for 12 months of the year for multiple years, you could say, are they moving more in certain months than other times of the year? And how does that change? And here you could say, well, during months seven and eight, June, July, July, August. July, August, they're moving, a, this one's moving a little bit more. Um, for this sort of measure, if you, if you did a kernel density estimate, you get sort of the same picture. So there's a lot of, I know there's, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of literature about home range analyses and every, every new paper on a home range method will say everything that's been done prior to this is just crap and you gotta use the new method. Um, and one of the things I would point out is that for kind of measuring, just kind of a rough measure of how much space an animal's using, it often doesn't matter too much when you're saying, how does that change over time? So again, really think about what your questions are. If you want to say, how much is this animal, how much space is this animal going to use in its lifetime? It's a very different sort of question this, than this. This is just saying, I want a rough index of how much space an animal's using and how that changes over time. This can be a really simple, effective, exploratory way to get at that. Exactly. So that's one of the that's one of the other key pieces I would say is do a sensitivity analysis with whatever you're doing. Say, does my answer change if I tweak something that was rather arbitrary? The choice between these two methods in my mind is fairly arbitrary. And the beautiful thing here is it doesn't matter. Uh, and Johannes actually has a nice paper that kind of makes that argument. So if you do need a reference, um, I could send you one there too for these sorts of questions about relative amounts of space used, um, it often doesn't make a big difference. Okay. So 
the rest of this is having to do with generating available points before fitting resource selection functions or step selection functions. So I think this is probably actually a good time to stop um, and maybe play around with your own data and see if you can um, adapt the code to, to your own data and, and see how far you can get. And then uh, after, so after lunch, we can start talking about resource selection functions and then c revisit this part of the code and that'll fit into maybe where Sarah's can going you, next. Can you look at the shared document for a second? The shared folder? Yes. Um, uh, one sec. So our studio project file, is that where the project file is? No, so, what, so with the instructions, what I wanted everyone to do, so if you, did, if you had problems running this, my goal was you would download the move bank folder. So everything, put it anywhere you want on your computer, and then the rest of the instructions led you through create a project associated with wherever you put that on your computer. So then once you have that, everything should run. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll... We'll have lunch in 40 minutes, so that's some time to, uh, to try this with some of your own data uh, and then ask uh, questions to, if you have trouble making it work. Um, any questions now for the group? Let me, uh, yeah, can I just get on your? You bet. Uh, I'll just show, if you haven't already, um, done this, I'll show you, um, right, so uh, just go to MoveBank, um, click on the map, uh, if you log, you can log in if you want, but you don't need to. We do, um, Sarah, do you know when they're going to have the speedy MoveBank up for everybody? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But so there is there is a new um, I, I, it, it, there's a challenge to plot like a million dots on a map online really quickly and then zoom and move. And um, the move bank guys figured it out. And so there's a new version that we've been testing that will display points a lot faster for really big data sets. It's not. Oh, okay. Right. 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 I see. Okay. So, anyway, but it still works. So, uh, if you haven't been, to, if you haven't used MoveBank very much, I'll just show you real quickly. If you're looking for some data to play with, you can hit only data studies where I can see data. You can do a search for whatever uh, you know. If you want a specific species. Um, and you can go in and uh, look through and find the data that you're interested in. Um, let's say you want to look at some fruit bats from Ghana. You can click this button and see. Uh, you can click individual ones, click the magnifying glass, zoom in, uh, see the track over there in the map. Click it. It'll highlight the track. You say, OK, I want to download. The I button is where you download. And you either um, do it for the individual animal or you can do it for the whole study. You click uh, download search result. You have to, this is where you agree to the terms. Um, sometimes you'll hit the spot and it'll say data are not available for download. So if they have the data set where you can view the data but not download the data, you'll get stuck here. Um, and so I'll just agree. And now you can download as a CSV file. There's often a contact owner when the data is not available. Yeah. So if you, if, for, for playing around with before lunch, you probably don't have time to get that permission, but for the future, right? So, uh, and then at this point, you do the CSV. Um, a couple options here that are good to know about. Um, usually you, you don't want to include undeployed locations. That'd be like uh, test locations that you had on the GPS collar before you put it on the animal. Um, adding UTM coordinates is quite convenient. 
uh, if you're working in small scales. And then add local study time. It's also convenient if, you're, um, if you want to deal with time. Um, and then you just hit download, and it'll make the CSV and save it for you. Where? Oh. Close? Oh, yeah. Right. So if you go, to, so, so there's sort of two main pages in MoveBank, right? The map search and the studies, where you see sort of the detail of specific studies. And so if you want to see only data where I can download any data, now over here it'll show you this, <laughs> and you can browse through and see. And so these are all public, because I, I, I haven't logged in now, right? So these are all publicly available. Uh, data, and so you can say you want to look at the Orinoco goose, and then you go over here and say download data, or you can say data show and map and jump back to the map to see the Orinoco goose. Cool. So uh, that's a quick, quick, uh, quick way to find data if you haven't already used MoveBank. Um, why don't you play around with downloading that, switching the uh, file name uh, or renaming the file to be Martin, Martin Data, and then see if you can get it to run in the script. And we'll pace around and, and uh, see the cool map.